it's a, a wonderful, it's a real honor to do this. And, um, you know, uh, something that happens only once in a while. So I'm really grateful. Thank you. Um, this uh, really, uh, the, uh, this stems out of some work uh, which uh, both myself and, and Farah have <clears throat> contributed chapters to, um, which is up for publication. Um, will be coming out soon in, I think, is it going to be in Australia, Farah? I think it's going to be published in Australia, is it? Yes, oh, I'm, I'm not too sure. It's published by Routledge, so it may be. Routledge, yeah. Okay. So this is uh, based on some of the research that, I do, that, I, that I've done for that. Um, uh, and also, okay, so the title is Akhlaq. Um, and I want those of you who are non-Muslim to sort of see this as, um, <clears throat> you can you could subject, substitute Akhlaq in some ways in a limited sense for the purposes of meaning and understanding. Uh, as a moral education, all right? So I think what I'm saying here is also applicable to uh, other denominational schools and secular schools as well. Okay, so a few things uh, for you to keep in mind while I am um, presenting. So if you have kind of have these at the back of your mind, that would be helpful. Um, so I'm coming at this subject as an educator, not as a... Uh, a, a as a Muslim scholar, uh, though I am heavily influenced by the classical canon, but I'm coming to this from an educational point of view as an educationalist or an educator. And also, you know, I'm, I'm gonna just put my card straight out that my, <clears throat> my uh, the basis for much of what I write about is that my discomfort uh, at what's being done to education in general, and I'm not just talking about Muslim education, um, and that as with so many other areas of life, uh, you know, it's being system, systematized and reified. Um, and also, I'm very much coming from the position that childhood, indeed adulthood, uh, these, these kind of age hierarchies um, are being objectified and standardized and that, you know, we, we must uh, try to resist such things. So uh, those are some of the bases. And also that the quality of the, the quality of our existence in this world and in our lives results from the relationships that we have. Uh, and this is even more so for, for, for children. Yep. So the quality of relationships. So the more reified and the more objectified things become and the more, yeah, the, the more things are standardized, the, the relationships, as far as I'm concerned, are reduced. So I'm going to uh, start out with a sort of general context, general views on young people and Muslim educational reactions. The concept of akhlaq I'm gonna talk about, um, which I think, I hope will be both interesting for Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Uh, a breakdown is also an argument for the inclusion of two concepts, the uh, hudur and adab. The hudur should have a elongation there, but never mind. Uh, and I will tell you what those are. So I would like those to be considered by your thing. I would like those to be considered in, in relation with the akhlaq. Uh, and then also uh, I'm going to give a very modest, quick snapshot review, which I did for the, uh, for the article, for the chapter on educational materials and resources for the teaching of akhlaq, read moral education across the <clears throat> Muslim homelands and also uh, the, you know, settled countries, um, the, uh, the diaspora. Um, these will be, these were English materials in the main. Uh, that in, in English, I mean. Okay, and then also I'm going to make a proposal for Muslim education, but actually maybe for all education, to shed um, theorism 
moral theories and ethical approaches. And I'm going to ask for it to be replaced or for you to consider for it to be replaced by um, something I've called a sense of obligation, a sense of obligation, not moral obligation, a sense of obligation. Um, and that might be a bit contentious. Um, I don't want to go too heavily into the philosophy of, of, of morals and morality, because um, I think that needs more doing, but I will refer you, if you wish to look further into this, the dropping of morality to uh, J.D. Caputo and um, Against Ethics, which was, I found very, uh, quite inspiring. Uh, and then I give some practical examples in the classroom if we've got time, um, but I won't go into too much detail for reasons that I'll outline. And then the conclusion. So uh, the context uh, is as such. So all schools recognize the, the importance of developing behavior. Let me just see if I can get these uh, things here. Maybe just move it down a little bit. There we are, yeah. Okay, so all schools recognize the importance of developing behavior. Uh, it's taken more prominence over the, you know, the last uh, 10, 15 years, maybe, maybe even before that. Um, one of the claims that Muslim schools make, you'll notice that I don't say Islamic schools because I don't like the word Islamic, but we can talk about that another time. But one of the claims that Muslim schools, how they appeal to their parents is that they, you know, they have behavior in order, they've got it under control. Um, and the idea is that, you know, in a secular setting, behavior uh, is not as a uh, as guided and developed as it would be in a Muslim context. I'm not always sure that that's absolutely true. Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, and then we have the idea, oh, we have the idea that teenagers are essentially portrayed as wild and irresponsible, immoral, rude, violent, uh, you know, you know the score. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, um, if that's always true. Um, and I'm wondering also what responsibility should, should uh, schools, and in this case, Muslim schools, should they be taking for, for that behavior? Is there something that Muslim schools are doing or schools are doing that brings about such attitudes? Okay. So whatever the case may be, whatever the case is, uh, I'm going to put this down because it's very annoying. Wh whatever the case may be, uh, you know, it's clear that, well, I think all educators are struggling with the, the question of behavior, but Muslim and educators, perhaps in particular, because there is a more set idea of what such behavior uh, involves. Uh, okay, so... Uh, Hello? Habib. Uh, hello? I, I, I think if you continue. Okay. Someone's calling me Habib. Okay. So um, uh, Muslim society is faced with the problem of, of youths lacking ethics. It's long been a chronic problem that is frightening in its complexity, increasingly more severe because it's a problem that no one can completely solve. This is uh, Lahim in 2018. So there's clearly uh, a divide between expectations and what's actually occurring, okay? And the consequences uh, are either not as great as we imagine, or in the case of Muslim children and other children, but in the case of Muslim children, there are um, several other connotations that one must take into consideration. So now we come to the idea of akhlaq. Um, so one of the uh, sayings of the prophet, it's called a hadith, is a quite, for me, quite an amazing statement because it, it sums up the whole, if you like, the whole of the prophet's mission, which is that, you know, I've not been sent as a messenger except to perfect the khlaq, which means actually to refine behavior, okay? So a major component, perhaps the major component of the prophet's mission in terms of Islamic thought, is the refinement of character. 
the refinement of character, I think, in an aesthetic sense, uh, in a poesis sense, the refinement of character. And also another very famous uh, hadith, um, which is uh, to do with the word ihsan. Ihsan is a very difficult word to translate, but it's complete um, absorption. It's the person who is basically constantly um, aware of the divine presence. And the, 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 the hadith, the saying of the prophet says, you know, worship Allah as if you can see him for although you cannot see him or you may not see him, he can see you. And basically, I would say that these two hadith constitute the basis for uh, Muslim education. Mm. They form a very steady foundation upon which we, you know, many things flow forth. And so they are, like I would say, they're foundational and seminal. There are other things as well, but I would say that these two are really, really sum up the, uh, the, all of the objectives of such an education. So um, the word um, akhlaq, um, this is not a very good slide, I'm sorry. Uh, the word akhlaq is associated, uh, and we'll go into this a little bit more in a minute, is associated with the word khaliq, which is the, 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 one of the names of God, one of the attributes of God, the creator. Okay, so khalq is also the creation, okay? so. Um, akhlaq is the plural of khulq, uh, which means also um, the natural disposition of someone, okay, the, the, the combination of different qualities, positive, negative, or neither, or, you know, neutral, that make up uh, an individual. They're also known, th these different dispositions, the individual ones, which which make up the whole are, are known as malaka. Um, so the khulq is the plural. Uh, uh, sorry, khulq is, is the singular, and akhlaq is the plural. Okay, so there's a relation between these words. We'll, we'll look at it. So the etymological root of the word akhlaq is, uh, it goes on the screen, it will go the other way. It's kha lam qaf. Now you, you'll understand in a minute why this is important. Because Arabic is a language which is formula, which is formed around consonants. Okay, so vowels which are formed around consonants. So what you'll have is you'll have a central grouping or set of consonants from which many different concepts flow. Uh, a, a friend of mine many years ago did a, some uh, research, well, I think it was his PhD thesis, um, <clears throat> around the word, around the root cluster of R H M or Raha Mim, uh, from which many words. One of them is mercy and merciful, but also womb. Okay, so there there are many. There's like a network of ideas which are formed around these root consonants. Okay, we we'll call them consonant clusters. Uh, it's in the same other Semitic languages as well, um, and from a teacher's point of view, uh, you know, you can do a lot of very interesting work. And also you can, you can get a more rounded sense of the definition of words. Um, European languages like, like English and other languages are iconic. Whereas the, um, the Semitic languages are based on central, yeah, consonant clusters from which many, many, many ideas stem. So one word, it, it has a central meaning, but it has many nuances as well. So uh, Connor causes a, an extended flam, a family of words that form a kind of fluttering cloud or constellation of meaning. So um, these word concepts uh, and the clusters you can, if you know anyone's really interested in this, is uh, Edward Lane's Arabic English lexicon put together in the Victorian times was absolutely brilliant, um, and which takes the the root consonant and will delve into all the different uh, derivations 
uh, which come out of these, these uh, constant clusters, clusters. And so I'm going to use this to have a look at um, the word aflak. It's a poetical synthesis of definitions such as, okay, so this is now coming from the, those root consonants, uh, lam kaf. So it's something which is uh, related to measuring or proportioning uh, or as a thing replacing something else uh, or bringing into existence according to a certain measure. Here we're probably in you know, a little references to the divine uh, aspect uh, the, the, as the creator. Um, bringing into existence from a state of non-existence, okay, coming out of nothing into something. Um, adapted to and well disposed to clouds uh, becoming adapted or, or, or disposed to rain, okay, which in, a, in an Arabic sense has a lot of meaning because, you know, rain and water hold special uh, emphasis in, in Arab culture. Uh, also the notion of a smoothness or something burnished with no fissures, or cracks or, or smooth, a smoothness. Um, also the idea of, of something accustomed to. So again, to go back, just to make sure that you're, you're, you're clear what I'm saying, uh, the, there are words which denote all of these things that I'm going through now, which have the root, the consonant root that I, that I gave you. So probable, likely to happen, feigning in nature, not their own. Okay, so we, there's also negative connotations to this as well. So feigning in nature, not their own. Um, old worn out garments, a hill destitute of vegetation, uh, someone with no property. Okay, so if we took this now, the akhlaq of a, of a person, the sometimes akhlaq is used to refer to someone's good character, so it actually means both, yeah? But if we were to synthesize these definitions, uh, what, what might we come up with? Um, what is um, what we would call the prophetic mode uh, in, in, in young people? How could we uh, bring this about with these different nuances on the word akhlaq? So uh, could we propose maybe that akhlaq uh, from the human perspective, not the divine perspective. You know, there's two sides of the divine. Chalak is the, is the divine creator, but from the human perspective, um, could we sort of see a personality or a child uh, uh, evolving or, or uh, developing through some sort of proportioning and molding of character? Uh, might the measure include the potential, the likelihood or propensity for good? like the being who brings things to fruition, referring to the clouds? Could we see akhlaq as uh, denoting someone who's able to adapt to their surroundings seamlessly and smoothly, yet within sort of innate consistency of thought and deed? Uh, could we see it as somebody perhaps elevated in some way above, you know, the masses, above others through, by dint of their by dint of their, I don't want to say superior, but in some sense, I guess it would be, but by dint of, you know, creme de la creme, if we like. Um, but equally, equally, the potential is there for uh, someone being reduced to barren and mundane thought and action, destitute of vegetation, or uh, someone with no sense of self, no property, inauthentic, or, okay, so, so there we have a sort of composite idea of akhlaq, um, sort of extracted from these, these various meanings from, from the, the, the root clusters. So now we come to two other concepts. Uh, one of them is adab and hudur. So adab is, um, before I go into the root cause, I'm not going to go as deeply in 
to adab as I did with akhlaq, but um, adab is quite often uh, understood to be two things. One is literature, and the second one is um, good manners. But um, adab has different, in terms of manners, adab has different layers of meaning. Uh, and I think probably the, the ultimate would be something that we could denote as spiritual courtesy. Okay, spiritual courtesy. Um, a type of courtesy that, um, that requires one to be acutely aware of everything going around them. So the, the root consonants here are alif, dal, ba. Again, with the related meanings also from the lexicon. Uh, synthesize, I'm not going to go too much further than that, but sympathize, it seems to refer to a cultivated and articulate person, appreciative of the power of words and communication, a person whose company is nourishing, as in a banquet, okay, banquet is referred to in relation to Adda, or inviting people to a banquet, an open, welcoming person uh, who by dint of their nature naturally gathers people around them. Mm. And then there's this idea of presence as well, the idea of such a person being present and open in the moment in order to be able to do all of these things in, or, in order that they are nourishing, in order to be open, welcoming, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, a, uh, there's also another word, which is a phrase, which is used in Arabic, which is called Ibn al waqt which means the son or the daughter of the moment, okay? the son or the daughter of the moment. We'll come back to this. Um, and then there's a uh, hadith here, the words, uh, again, of the Prophet, but these are what we call hadith qudsi, which is a different, uh, slightly different um, type of hadith, which are meant to be pronouncements through the Prophet. So they're, in a sense, they are words inspired by Allah, by God, but they're not Quran, okay? So, in this one, it is said that this is Allah speaking now, this is God speaking, that when I love him or her, I am her or his hearing with which he hears, his seeing with which he sees, his hand with which he strikes, and his foot with which he walks. In other words, the movements, the actions of the individual are no longer uh, through a, th a thought process. There's no space between the act of the individual and divine inspiration. In other words, there's very little, uh, a very thin veil or perhaps no veil at all between the divine and the human being, okay? So um, this seems to refer to that type of person that we, that was referred to in the concept of Adam. So an akhlaqiyal position, I made up that word, it's probably very confusing, but it's to do with akhlaq. Uh, this disposition of akhlaq mixed with the adab is not a set of rules or uh, prescriptions, but um, a sort of inherent and inner balance of aesthetics and also a spontaneous way of expressing such, such things of being such things, maybe better to say. Okay, here we go. So the next word is hudur. Right, I should have, that one should be sticking out like that. Never mind. So the opposite of hudur, sometimes we, we take the negative view to explain the positive view. The, the, the opposite of hudur is ghayba, absence. But there's also an element of something called ghafla, which is also the opposite, which is a type of heedlessness or distraction which comes into play as contrasting. Hudur is again related both to akhlaq and to adab in that it, is, it, it means presence. Okay, it means being present in the moment, the Ibn al-Waqt, which I spoke about before. So um, my idea was that in, in order to teach akhlaq, uh, you know, we live in a time of great distraction. Um, attention has become a commodity. People's attention has become a commodity. And I think you know what I'm talking about. The, uh, you know, the mobile phone, the, uh, 
the uh, Facebook, the social media, et cetera, et cetera, constantly um, calling on our attention. In fact, as I said, attention is, is a commodity. Uh, it's become a commodity, the, uh, attempting to, to get our, uh, the, the uh, software companies, et cetera, atten attempting to get our attention, um, you know, work flat out. Not with any, I don't think, evil intent itself, but it's just a sort of a self uh, evolving uh, thing. So this distraction, uh, this reba, is 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 when when one's not aware of you know actually where really where you are. You have some vague notion where you are, but you know your half of your mind is not there. There's a disconnection. Uh, and, and you just see the facade of things, okay? Now, under such circumstances, which I believe that, you know, all, almost all of us are under the thrall of, but particularly young people, um, the, you know, attention spans and so on are very lax. And it's almost, uh, it, it's difficult to see how akhlaq, adab could ever come into place when there is this type of distraction and the absence of the self. So before anything could ever happen, um, some kind of action needs to be taken, mm, perhaps educationally, just, or perhaps in some other way, but you know, the, something needs to be done, not, not only for our young people, but also uh, for ourselves as adults, yeah? something needs to be done, our, our consciousness needs to be, uh, our conscious needs to be raised on this because, um, yeah, uh, the distraction is becoming a real problem. All right, so now I'm gonna move on to the, the quick review of uh, current, um, like a snapshot, and um, it's not comprehensive by any means. I just wanted to provide or have an idea of the, the current materials which are used in the Muslim world, um, mainly in the English language, not all, uh, which are used in, in teaching akhlaq. Um, perhaps I should have put this at the beginning of things to hold in the background. I am going to suggest that akhlaq is not a subject like other subject areas. I'm going to suggest that akhlaq is not something which can be taught instructionally. I'm going to suggest that it is not, it's almost counterproductive to have a, have a period where akhlaq is taught theoretically uh, because it's not a thing. Akhlaq is not a thing. Uh, and it's been somewhat reified um, within Muslim culture. So here we go. Um, Call from different Muslim countries and other countries where Muslims have settled. Like I said, it's not comprehensive. It's a random snapshot. Uh, I created a set of criteria, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> set of criteria to help me, you know, be able to navigate through to have some, you know, to have some structure or whatever. Uh, and here they are. Um, so I looked at the nature of the objectives. So I looked at various things. I looked at curricula, I looked at uh, uh, textbook resources, other types of learning materials, et cetera, et cetera. So I looked at the nature of the objectives. I looked at the meaningfulness and relevance. I looked at something which is called educational mileage. Now I say this a lot and people are always after, what is that? You know, And it's something I was taught when I was at teacher's training college in the UK. Um, so educational mileage is, you know, how much learning uh, are you getting out of, uh, out of the particular concept that you, or activity that you're doing and the concept that you teach, how much goes on in the mind of the learner, okay? And also another thing in terms of uh, resources and textbooks and so on, is the uh, the author's perspective on ch on the childhood and, and and the child? Okay, so um, the age appropriateness of the materials provided. So the nature of the objectives, is the first one. Um, it became very clear that uh, 
I'm not going to name the countries because I want to be able to travel around the world. I don't want to get my visas stopped. But um, <clears throat> what's uh, frequently this uh, comes under the heading of Islamic values, particularly in the Arab speaking countries, which is actually where akhlaq comes up, um, in, in, in especially in the Arabic countries. Um, you can see very clearly that they're utilized um, as social engineering, what Sartre calls uh, functionalization of religion. And I believe the book is called, that he wrote, it's in my, my references to the book that he wrote, was called Putting Islam to Work. Uh, so it's, um, yeah, it strengthens the, the loyalty to their homeland. Okay, this is, this is from one of the uh, materials I looked at. I don't want to say where it's from. I will say that it is an Arab-speaking Arab country, but this was an English resource in that Arab-speaking country. <clears throat> so akhlaq is seen as, the objective of it is seen as contributing to strengthen the loyalty to their homeland. So feelings of patriotism, contribute to nation building, and, and to become one of the best countries in the world. Okay, so Islam or akhlaq is put to use for this. Um, Starrett's going back to him again. He says a whole series of existing religious discourses have been reified, systematized in novel fashion and set to work fulfilling the strategic and utilitarian ends of the modern and secular discourse, okay? So I think that this is very much in contretemps with uh, akhlaq as it is pure. All right, so uh, here's somebody else in Fadl. I took out the name of the country because I don't want you, I, you will see it is actually in the article, but uh, <clears throat> it says it's Islamic do it's doctrines, it's symbolisms and linguistic constructs are persistently utilized by this particular country to, legitim to legitimate, uh, legitimize, I think, and maintain themselves in power. The exploitation of religion as a means to keeping a conservative and exploitative elite in power is a staple uh, of everyday life in this country. So uh, in other countries, it was uh, slightly different, slightly softened, I would say. Um, where interpretations of the prophetic way, when I say that, I mean the, the, the way of uh, Muhammad, the way of the prophet uh, of Islam, uh, his way of being, his way of uh, conducting relations, his words, his, his mannerisms, etc., cetera, um, was established not so much now to um, bolster the nation state, and the, the, the idea of the nation state, if I may say so, in my opinion, is again something which is contrary to, to Islam. Uh, but um, here it was more for, um, for keeping the peace, for having some sort of a social uh, pact of uh, keeping, keeping law abiding citizens. Yeah, so slightly different, but nonetheless. Uh, uh, ulterior motives, should we say. Then there are other ones which are just pure morality, I would say. So this was a statement from one of them. This was a, um, uh, a Muslim country in Africa, I say no more than that. Um, good moral behavior is a basis for a successful Islamic life. Okay, at the, in the face of it, you may say, hmm, what's the matter with that? I mean, I find it, um, I find it very flat, uh, lacking any of the numinous qualities of, uh, of religious life and feeling. Um, and uh, a very wonderful book by a man called Eric Wink Winkle parodies this, uh, parodies this by saying, you no, know, it's as if... Um, what not this particular saying, but this is an example of um, if only we will change ourselves. And there is this attitude within several Muslim societies if only we will change ourselves, become punctual, more brotherly, and technically correct, 
Allah will make us successful like the Japanese and the Americans. Okay, so um, it's another sort of pure morality. Now, I will ask at this point, does akhlaq have or need a purpose? And, and I would say to you, no, I, I would say that's a moral. Uh, akhlaq, the cultivation of good character is a thing unto itself. You may extend that by saying theologically, uh, you know, it, it brings one closer to uh, to the divine. It, it also secures one's salvation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those are true, but I think that there are things which are just good in themselves. So uh, the second category that I looked through these things was meaning and relevance, the educational meaning, the relevance for for the young people that they were supposedly serving. So, uh, yeah, one thing that came up quite a lot, but I must say that there were several exceptions. I, I haven't concentrated too much on, on the, the exceptions, but the majority of material which I saw was, if you like, I would have to place in a deficient mode. So um, one objective from another country, um, was this, um, to understand that shaking hands is an Islamic courtesy and understand that giving salam is the best way to greet others. Um, this is a kind of defensiveness mm, and it, it, it mundanizes and it diminishes the, um, I think the, um, the grandeur, shall we say, that we get a, a, some notion of in the Quran, uh, 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 Allah says, um, you know, addressing the Prophet himself, you know, you are, you have a, a, you are of a mighty, enormous character. And the word the khalq is used. You're, you have a, a mighty character. Uh, the other thing that I was very interesting and something I think should be looked into further, and I think I, I will, um, the attitudinal difference between Arab speaking countries and the residual French and Anglo-Saxon colonial influences. One of these is that in the English speaking, uh, the countries that have an English colonial past, there was, uh, and also quite geographically distant from one other, from one another, um, there was a kind of a real emphasis on like cleaning your hands and you know, toilet habits and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas in the French colonial, uh, old French colonial residues, there was much less of that. And it had more to do with values, but there was a real uh, difference there. Okay. Um, so meaning also, so when, when um, you know, good teaching means that uh, the more relevant uh, it is to the student or the pupil, the more the research shows, the more that <clears throat> motivation to learn increases. So it's important that the, uh, the teaching content is relevant to the student or pupils. Uh, and meaningless content is dangerous in that if repeated too often within a subject, it imparts an unfavorable uh, profile to that particular subject. So what I'm trying to say here is that if akhlaq is taught, uh, in a way which is mundane, boring, platitudinal, then the subject becomes boring and the people who teach that, and there's a lot of research on this as well in all subject areas, if a mass teacher is a bit grumpy and not very uh, communicative and uh, quite strict and not very, uh, then the subject takes on that character as well. Well, likewise, in the teaching of Akhlaq, if it's platitudinal, uh, patronizing, uh, and basically boring, then the subject takes on on that uh, that character, and by you know, and by default, this can go on to Islam. So the low expectations of a subject can last well into adulthood. So that Islam itself is tainted, if you like, in some ways, by such poor teaching. So uh, 
there's this uh, phenomena that developed in the 60s and 70s. Uh, it was a group of people and, and you know, may Allah award them, may Allah award them for, for, for their efforts at the time. And also, I, you know, I don't want to be too critical of the people who've created these things. They, you know, they're working, uh, they're working without a full understanding at the moment of, of, of the child's needs and uh, requirements. Um, so anyway, the, there was, a, it was called, um, Islamicizing and, and things were which were not Muslim were Islamicized, uh, or things were which were not were neither Islamic or non-Islamic, but they were also Islamicized. So you know the teaching of hand washing and so on, um, if it's filtered through you know being Islamicized that you know this is a a Muslim thing to do and the Prophet washed his hands and so on, uh, it it hollows out the meaning. Um, on both sides. It hollows out the meaning of the, the prophetic mode and it also hollows out the meaning of washing hands because it's something that's repeated over and over. So, and it loses relevance. Um, okay, so educational mileage, the one that I said a lot of people don't understand, this one is really the, uh, you know, how much learning is mileage, how, what's the What's the learning distance from being taught to learning something and going further with this? So this was a text out of one of the textbooks of an example of ineffectual mileage. So the question was, why does the mother treat the wounds of her child? You know, and then, um, you know, this was like to eight or nine year old children. Uh, and I would suggest to you that's an example of very low mileage. Um, another activity in a textbook which had the, uh, the heading, I find out, um, had a question like, who is the Lord of, of animals? Who is the Lord of the plants? Uh, and then this was immediately followed by a close procedure exercise where the pupils had to fill in, you know, so blank, Allah taught animals to get their food in order to live. It's just not, it's not challenging. Uh, and it's not taking, it's not stretching uh, the children's ability in any sense or, or words. So there's no, there's very low mileage here. So we go on quickly to the author's perspective. So the age appropriateness. Um, now we're talking really about the textbooks. Okay, so there was a real uh, evidence of what I've called Disneyfication. Disneyfication is actually a whole social theory, which goes hand in hand with McDonaldization. And I would dare say that not only in the subject of akhlaq, but in, in, in teaching and learning as a whole, that a lot of our knowledge within all schools has something which has become increasingly McDonaldized, okay? with its four components. I won't go into that now, but Disneyfication is another type of social theory stemming out of McDonaldization. Um, so uh, law says, uh, Disneyfication is characterized by educational content reduced to forms of moral simplicity. Uh, sorry, Hastings says that. And this is content that pretends to give young readers credit when actually they are dumbing down to them. Okay, so this was very evident, not only in the in the language used and the material and content used, but also in the artwork and the layout of the pages. Um, the public perception of children's books seems to confirm the idea that if something is for children, it had better be obvious. Okay, so that was very, very clear. Um, whereas, you know, research clearly shows that that children quite at a quite young age, you know, there's um, the philosophy for children movement, which deals with children of, at, at four years old. So children are capable of quite sophisticated thought, as long as things are put in a way which, which allows them access to, to take things further. Right, so <clears throat> that was quite evident quite frequently. 
Um, all right, so the whole overview very quickly was that, um, I don't want to go into detail, but I came to the conclusion that, you know, education and akhlaq need to be shorn of all of these, these things, especially the, um, the uh, if you like, ursiping the, the, the objectives, you know, for, the, for the, the benefit of the state or the nation state. The pretense, the prescriptiveness, the low expectations, uh, and that you know that something else has to take place, something else which imparts um, the aesthetic uh, of a refined human being in relating to the world around them and the other people within it. Not just moral codes, no, not the codification of behavior, which in some ways uh, in Islam, and I would say also in other religions, but we're talking particularly of Islam at the moment, um, the codification of behaviors as being sunnah and as being akhlaq. So now I move on to the argument of, on that last note, I move on to the argument of um, morality or teaching morals and an idea to replace that with the, what I've called obligation or spontaneous obligation. So, uh, oh, here we go, ethics, okay, the science of morality, so ethics and morality are connected, is simply a human theoretical construct, I'm arguing here, uh, which makes a futile attempt to place a grid work or an inframing upon the constant uh, unfolding of the divine creation or, you know, or leave the divine creation aside, if you wish, simply existence, okay? Um, if there's any doubt about that, there's a verse in the Quran which says, you know, it, that, that Allah knows what you know not. What seems to us to be irrational, even absurd, the things that occur, look at us now. Um, in the middle of this pandemic, um, there, from the human view, these this is chaos. This is chaos, and yet um, morality tries to place on top of this chaos, um, you know, an uh, framing, a grid work, uh, you know, and and, and 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 it doesn't it doesn't work. So um, chaos theory is now being um, advanced more and more as a, as a realistic view of the world. And uh, this, this constant shift in flux, which occurs in unpredictability, which occurs um, to, to, try and, uh, to try and place, uh, you know, solid, um, uh, rules and regulations uh, just is absurd to my mind. So I know that people will be saying now that, uh, wow, you know, what's he saying that, you know, the Sharia, the Sharia is the religious law. The fiqh is the, mm, the jurisprudence, the uh, application of the Sharia to everyday situations. The Sunnah is the, tightly associated with akhlaq, is the habit of the prophet. So I'm arguing in, in my article that these, uh, these are not, doesn't uh, the, the idea of chaos theory and the absurdity of trying to place um, uh, in a, an inframing or a grid work on, it doesn't negate the Sharia, the Fiqh or the Sunnah in any way whatsoever. These are, if you like, from a Muslim point of view, these are revealed and or, or originating from, from Allah, expressed through the prophet and they offer some type of um, human orientation uh, in the middle of the chaos, and it offers some sort of foothold uh, when faced with this, the immensity um, of the constant evolving of time and movement and everything. Everything is changing constantly. And this gives some foothold but one must be aware, nonetheless, that it is a foothold, 
and that just underneath the surface is roiling away, roiling away the, 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 divine, uh, the divine plan, which seems to us, with our limited understanding, seems to us chaos. Uh, so um, here is probably one difference that has come to the fore very often in the past hundred years or so. Mm -mm. Is the fiqh, is the sharia, is it a set of laws or codes of behavior which are to be placed upon everyday existence? Or are they principles? And this is more the classical position. Are these principles which are applied to particular situations which may have different outcomes according to the, the time and the place and the context in which they take place. Okay? So for those of you who are non-Muslim, uh, what you often see as um, conflict between more conservative, often what's called the Wahhabi or Salafi positions uh, and other Muslims who are classical, neoclassical, sometimes called, um, this is one of the issues, okay? So one is, is pr proposition, or sorry, proposing that, um, that these rules and regulations are adhered to in whatever situation, whereas the classical uh, position is more that uh, the context, the time and the place and the, the, uh, the customary, what they call uh, uh, the customary habits of that society play a huge role in such things. And this classical position seems much more uh, able to deal with the impermanence, the, 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 the seeming chaos which roils beneath and boils beneath our everyday lives. So uh, Caputo, John Caputo um, says the science of morality involves imperfect human judgment. Okay, morality involves imperfect human judgment and can lead so easily to prejudice, hypocrisy, self-righteousness, and arrogance. And, and because it's a human construct, <clears throat> it can't digest movement, becoming, temporality, genuine novelty, and the attempt to do so results in ridiculous logicis logicizations. So um, again, this, uh, the cosmic import of what I'm saying here, this, uh, this um, seeming chaotic world, which is just under the surface, can be seen very clearly in the story of Abraham. <clears throat> Kierkegaard writes a great deal about this, but um, so, you know, what, wh where do the moral, uh, where does moral theory come in when a man says that he's taking his son up to the top of the mountain to sacrifice him? Where is the, the moral theory there? And then there's another story, Quranic story, and there are others as well. There's another Quranic story um, which refers to somebody who's not actually given a name in the Quran, but his name is Sidna al Khidr. Um, who does a series of things which see with, and he's traveling with, with Moses, does a series of um, things which appear to have no sense. And in fact, in some cases seem to be uh, destructive. But then uh, Moses is <clears throat> wishing to learn from this person and eventually becomes so shocked by what he perceives as his behavior that he leaves him. Uh, but then eventually we discover what is actually behind this seemingly chaos, uh, uh, which seems in some way destructive or harming others, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, those are clear indications that, that rules and regulations are sometimes not adequate in dealing with, uh, with this. So that's basically my argument. I, I, I think I could, go deeper into the whole philosophy of uh, morality. 
Um, but I think that calls, because it's a very deep subject, and I think that would call for another time, another place. But it's something that needs to be unpacked. So, um, so I've said that uh, moral, moral, moral theory uh, or, or th morals are theoretical, whereas the more praxis comes into play more, I think, the, the practical behaviors, the form and manner, the implications, the world and they take place in, I believe take precedence before theory. Um, I, I, and I, that's what I'm arguing here. But um, people will be up in arms. I know that um, when this has been suggested philosophically before, people get quite upset. But I'm proposing here, would it be possible to, to ground akhlaq or this moral education, take away the moral, uh, and adab within the context of the aware presence, which I spoke about before, the hudur, and to place it within um, a framework, or I don't actually want to have the framework. I don't want to have it not with the framework, but to, to place it within uh, some sort of context of the in the moment obligation, but not moral obligation, which is slightly or even considerably different. So um, this came to me uh, as a result of an Arabic response, an everyday response. Um, which you get throughout the Arab world, when you thank somebody for something, it's very often um, occurs that they say, la shukran ala waji, which means, I want to translate it as easily as it trips off the tongue in Arabic, but it means, you know, no thanks for something which is obligatory. And, and I wanted, I took that obligatory and I wanted to play with that idea that, that someone does something because simply the obligation rises. Something occurs in which one is not morally obliged, but just is obliged, you know, without the moral theory. Not, oh, the, you know, this is such and such a thing. Now, as a sort of a good person, I should know. But uh, like in the moment, um, obligation that arises. So uh, something which comes to one's attention and obliges a response. No moral theory, no recourse, just instantaneous obligation. So um, I summed it up like this. The, the balance is checked. The broken is repaired. The missing is put to hand. The agitated is soothed. The rough is smooth. The fire is doused. The amiss is realigned and the gap is filled and the moment passes, okay? So uh, I, I thought this is probably the best way for me to sum up what I'm trying to say. The balance is checked. So uh, I'm now not gonna talk very much longer. I, I, I'm not gonna go too much into the practical, but what does this mean in terms of all this uh, theory? I, I don't want theory, but, but all of these ideas, should we say? Um, what implications does this have for the classroom? Well, um, I took something which I call the anatomy of a sneeze. Uh, because in the Islamic tradition, in the Muslim tradition, um, when somebody sneezes, uh, they say, Alhamdulillah, all praise to Allah. And there, there are like set replies, Alhamdulillah, there are set replies which take place. And these are the sort of things that are often taught theoret theoretically in the classroom. And what I wanted to do is to show how we could move away from that. Okay, I haven't, have I, yeah, okay. So even when presenting it um, in the paper, I, in, the, in the article, I, I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to set it out too, I, I don't want it to become just yet another theory to, or another program to improve, you know, because that's exactly what, what I'm thinking that we don't want. I'm trying to propose that we orientate ourselves 
towards something without being prescriptive because I, I think our modern education modes which have been taken on by Muslims as well um, are so um, uh, ob objective orientated uh, steps and procedures and such as and, and, and I think we need to move away from that I think we need to bring something more of the ruhaniya, of the, of the spirit of things, okay? So I don't, I don't want it to be too, too standardizing, and that's why I don't want to go into it too much here. Um, because when you do that, it's, it's, it, it stops spontaneity. Um, so my idea really was that you, akhlaq is not taught in the class on the board akhlaq occurs in the moment during the day and the teacher's job in a way is to be ready and waiting to pounce on those moments and to utilize them um, whereby their value becomes so much more meaningful and, and I think I you know I stand in good stead here because um, pedagogically the uh, the efficacy of this can be seen in the way that the Quranic revelation would descend onto the prophet, onto, onto the prophet um, in particular moments. So the, the Quran was, was delivered in particular moments wherein something had occurred, okay? It's what's called the Asbab and Nuzul, the, the, uh, the, the explanation or the circumstances of the descent of the, of the verses. Um, in response to some immediate event, discussion or event. So I think this idea of, of a khlaq being experienced by the children in the moment or by the pupils or students in the moment has something more to it. So, uh, and also there's various exercises in there. I don't go into very much either, which is to increase the presence um, of children. Now, mindfulness now has become quite uh, well known and seems quite beneficial. And, uh, and I think that there are some very good benefits around um, using mindfulness in various ways through various activities during the day. So someone sneezes and the occasion is used to look into not only what the at the end of several other things is the, 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 the traditional response of the prophet. But before that, we look into several different societies uh, and the fact that a sneeze has always been something noticeable, uh, something sh quite shocking in a sense, something which breaks the, the pattern of the day. To, so in other words, to make the, uh, the, the students and the pupils aware, aware of their surroundings, aware of the moments, okay? so. The sneeze as a shocker, as a as a as a as a wake upper, as a yeah, and also then to look at many of the different traditions, cultural traditions, what people thought the sneeze was, including the uh, Muslim philosophy on what a sneeze, a sneeze indicates. And there are various theories, um, sometimes contradicting. Uh, so I would look at all that, and then eventually. Uh, Pick apart the 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 the, the, the particular formulaic uh, response between uh, someone who sneezed and so on and so forth. So I think uh, I don't think I'm going to think. Oh well, here's the yeah here are the references. Um, but I think that's all I want to say now. And probably I'll find now that I've been talking for 20 minutes and there's no one there anymore. So <laughs> so I hope that you're there. Um, actually, you've been talking for well over an hour. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> but um, there's plenty of people here. There's plenty of people still here, and I'm Thank sure you. they've got many questions. Um, okay. So we'll just move very quickly on to the questions now. If, if anybody wants to ask a question, I'll ask you to sort of raise your hand in the participants because I can't see everybody. Um, so I will be able to see if you just click on participants, and then there's something there where you can just raise hand. Um, and then I can ask you to to speak. I can unmute you and ask you to speak. Okay, so Helen, um, okay, let me see if I can do you from here. Yep. Uh, so Helen, could you unmute yourself? And... Hello. Hi, Helen. Hi, hi. 
Thank you very much. Um, that was interesting. And there were lots of ideas there that um, are beautiful ones, aren't they, really? But they're also, um, from as I, as I understand it, of a, a, a Muslim context of education, some of the implications of, of what you're suggesting could be quite challenging. Um, and, and so I, I'd like to, to push you, if I may, on, on a few, few of the things that you were saying, sure. and, but also to highlight some of the uh, comparisons that the Akhlaq, uh, forgive my pronunciation, um, brings up for me to do with silence in schools as an ethos. Uh -huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, because silence, like akhlaq, as you're as you're describing it, is is a is a is a non-entity, but is also a presence, and it's something that we could suggest is connected to a sense of the divine, mm -hmm. um, and and also the two have similarities, perhaps in or it sounds like it to me, in that they are moral, and yet they have no moral framework. Yes. Okay. But um, I suppose where I'm interested to um, kind of uh, push, push it a little bit is to understand from you um, how, uh, when you mentioned now um, the Shahia law and you mentioned something, uh, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Fiqh? Fiqh, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, so if you have this, this non-entity presence, which is a substantial force, an energy, um, a benefit, we could say, um, of the akhlaq, and it's in the lives of children, in the lives of a school, and, and, and it's, it's forming its network in the interrelations of the classroom or the school uh, community. Mm -hmm. um, and you offer it this opportunity uh, to um, be in, in situ, as you suggest. So rather than be linked to a moral framework that is set and prescriptive, mm -hmm. that there is more of a, a sense of, and this is very, very beautiful in relation to what you were saying about the, the prophet, this, this idea of being responsive and alive and responsible to the moment. That's a very, it's a very sort of moral, but yet morally free and deeply um, divine set of ideas that I can imagine would come from, from the prophets sort of handing over of teachings to, to, to uh, his people. So um, I'm, I'm just wondering in all of this context of, of beauty and possibility, freedom, but also of a morality of its own kind, how you see uh, in, in connection to the, uh, the law, shall we say, loosely speaking, yeah. how you see it working when people don't know how far or how not far to go. So you've got this, this expansiveness, this potentiality. How, how do you manage, how do you um, organize it in the sense of not stretching it too far such that it breaks? Mm. So in a context connected to silence, and I'll just say this very briefly, because I'd oh. like to hear from you. In silence, you. You can have silence, but as soon as somebody in, in a community of others, as soon as somebody breaks the silence, they're sabotaging the potential of that silence for, for those present. And yeah. so in your context, it's, all, it's about, is it not? It's about, well, how do you deal with the fact that some people could stretch that too far such that it becomes a form of immorality? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I mean, first of all, thank you. I mean, it's an excellent question and, 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 and I, you know, I'm, I'm glad because you, you, it seems that you, you understood what I'm saying, um, except I would like to take away the morality. Um, I'd like to take it away um, because it's for the purposes of what I'm saying, I just like to kind of place it on the side. Um, now, the, what you're saying is, yes, um, I think you, you know, this is, the, it's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing. And also, I don't think there's any steps or anything that I would like to propose because, you know, if I do so, then once again, we're entering into some kind of new methodology, which is, you, you know, you know what I mean? So I think that we have to ride as teachers, we have to ride on our intuition. And we have to feel, and we have to know, and we have to be, we have to be mojud, we have to be in the hudur, we have to be present. 
and I'm sure that there will be mistakes. But I think we need we need, we need to move away from the kind of traditional ideas of how we control the situations and we need to work on intuition. I know that's not a satisfying answer because I think that we're not used to having answers to such questions which are not you know, set out, we do this, we do that, and then we do this. But in a way I want to, and I'm not uh, diminishing your, your question at all, but I'm just saying this is a good example for us all that we, we want these ready-made answers. And I, I don't want to give you one, if that makes any sense. And it's, <laughs> you may think it's, I mean, just one. Yeah, well, he's, one trying to escape. Possible... he's trying to yeah, escape. I, I, I totally understand what you're saying. And of course, in this sense, but my, my issue is, you know, and you said, oh, no morality. Uh, yeah. But when you said morals take precedence before theory, um, that's very difficult um, because what you're talking about is you're well, talking I was being, about. I was being critical there. I was being. Maybe I maybe I, I typed it out wrong. I, I. No, I, I think moral theory. I, I can't remember exactly the one that you're saying. So so. Um, yeah, you said morals take precedence before theory, but I think you didn't mean to say that because it doesn't make no. sense with what you're saying. No, I didn't mean to say that. So it's wrong. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, yeah, you're you know, way. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm saying that uh, yeah, that might be the situation as is at the moment. So, see, with, with, with the moral mindset, we encounter a situation and it's almost as if there, you know, so let's say you encounter another person in a particular situation and there's two of you there, but there's also a third entity, which is the moral filter by which we're, we're, we're passing everything through. It's almost like a third entity. Whereas really what I have a feeling that people of the nature of the prophet and other enlightened and illumined beings don't have that filter. They, they, they interact, as I said, with the idea um, he um, sees with my eyes. They don't, they don't have the theory there. They simply are, they simply react and because they're so present, they do the right thing at the right time or the right moment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Does that, does that make any sense? So you're asking us all to be like that. We're not gonna be like that, but we can certainly, it's worth orientating ourselves towards that. Partially. Right? I, sorry, I, I'm, I'm sorry, can I just, um, I, I'm afraid of this cut, but three other hands up and I really wanna bring other people in, but that was really fascinating. And I've got a lot of things I wanted to say about the discussion you two just had, but. I'm going to keep quiet and I'm going to bring in Roger. Roger want, uh, had a question. So Roger, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Have I managed to do that? Just while we're waiting for just Helen, very good questions. And of course, it's an ideal to aspire to. It's not something that- Roger seems to have disappeared. I hope that wasn't due to me. Um, <laughs> Roger, if you're there, can you unmute yourself? You're going to have to, I've, I think I've given you permission, you should be able to unmute. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to Roger. The next person I think is Pfizer. Pfizer, can you unmute yourself? Hi, am I audible? Yes. Perfect. Thank you for the fascinating presentation. I really liked it. I have just one question from, um, I wanted to know about uh, how, since you have been traveling around the world and you observe the different textbooks that taught, they teach a clock, I just wanted to know, do you find, or did you find any curriculum that is problematizing a clock? Because uh, I, what I have found so far is we as teachers teach morals and ethics and all these is part of curriculums. But I am struggling to find curriculums that problematizes a clock. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for that. I mean, I, I didn't travel around the world. I, I travel around the world on my computer. So I, I accessed all of these things on the internet. But um, when, when you say problematize, can, can, you, can you really explain to me a little bit more what you mean there? 
for example, we talk about doing good with someone, like being morally nice, being generous. For example, let's take example of generosity. Yes. It's one of uh, ethics or one of the morals that we teach in our classroom. Yes. Um, I come from a Muslim background and I teach in a Muslim setting school. Yes. And that's where I wanted to understand. We teach generosity is a moral concept, but our curriculums are not uh, problematizing why we need to be generous. It's okay that it talks about yeah. we need to help someone, but why is the help yes. required? Yes, yes, I see your question. Well, uh, look, I think there's only one way to do this, and that is to take that to take that moral theory, place it aside, and to enact, and also, for instance, in the class, when, when somebody is you know, unconsciously, with, you know, without being aware of themselves, is kind to somebody else, seize upon it, seize upon it, discuss it, get other people to talk about it, think about it. So again, you know, you're using the moment to highlight, uh, you know, the, 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 the act of gen generosity, use it, okay? Um, instead of going through a textbook on generosity. So you, you actually use it um, and it happens. You just have to, you know, teachers have to be really awake and really aware. And they have to identify with the, with the students or the pupils a lot. It requires, it's, it's not, a, what I'm talking about is an ideal. And I'm also, I'm throwing this out to foment discussion, okay? To, to think about um, orienting ourselves differently. I'm not uh, talking about, you know, you achieving results tomorrow with this new method. No, not at all. But I would say, um, seize upon the moment. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so we have a, qu a question in writing because there's a microphone not working from Philip Salman. Um, who's doing a PhD in social anthropology at the University of Cambridge. And he's asking, did you observe a form of reflexive self-cultivation of a clerk among young people regarding the numerous jurisprudence potentially available and apart from schools teaching within, uh, I think he means within charity association, Quranic recitation classes, internet, etc. And he wanted, he'd like to thank you for a fascinating presentation. I hope you understand the question. Could, could, you, could you repeat it one more time? So or maybe the, try and paraphrase it for me. Yeah, I think, I think the question's asking, did you observe, have you ever observed a form of reflexive self-cultivation of akhlaq among young people? Yes. Not necessary in school though. Okay, so are, are young people capable of this? Definitely, without any doubt. Um, do they require mm, things to be guided? Perhaps, but not always. So the, the skill, perhaps for the teacher now, is this really light hand that I was talking about with, with uh, Helen, um, this intuitive way, and it's demanding a lot, uh, you know, I, I, I realize. Uh, and, and so that we can, if you, if you like, we may be able to guide such things, but not, um, not in controlled situations, I would say. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to try and go back to Roger. I don't know if Roger is able to unmute himself. Perfect. Roger, would you like to ask your question? You're no longer muted, so you should be able to speak. I can hear very low. Maybe he needs to turn the volume up or something. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm afraid we really can't hear you. I think maybe you need to think about the microphone. I'll come back to you again. But if I can go to Hafsa, who's been waiting really patiently. Hafsa, can you unmute yourself now? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Um, yeah, I have just one question. I was thinking that when we speak about being in a moment and being aware of it, yes. um, and you're, we are using our intuition and we are more Jude there, yeah. but then when you have a responsibility there to give a response which is suitable and which is based on your hikmah, 
what level, um, how do we work on this to be able to have a right response to the, to the moment? Okay, well, part and parcel of the prophetic message is for us to be engaged in constant uh, muhasaba, you know, in constant self-reflection, to watch the self, to be aware of ourselves in the different situations and the effects that we're having on different people. And, and, I, and I'm not saying that what I'm proposing here is going to be something which you, you or, or I will be able to achieve within, you know, a set number of days of training or anything of that sort. Okay. So, uh, but it's, it's something that, you, you know, with, with the intention, with the Nia, with the intention and with the will, if we want to, I, I, I feel that we will move some way towards, towards that. And we may never succeed, but it's certainly worth the journey. It's certainly worth the effort. And I have a feeling that there will be small successes. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll come on to Mariam now. Mariam, can you unmute yourself? Um, Assalamualaikum. Thank you for the um, amazing presentation. I just had um, one question um, from a pedagogical um, point of view. Mm -hmm. So I teach, um, I teach, I'm a reception teacher in a Catholic primary school. Um, and I just wanted to ask, what is your view on using behavior charts um, in order to guide children to the best o'clock? Blah. Don't like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry don't yeah. like it sorry no this is a i hope that i'm not offending you in any way no, no absolutely not uh but i mean this is this is the type of thing this is the type of standardized uh methodological approach to uh, to human behavior which denies the humanity of the of the teacher and the pupil and the student yeah. Uh, I don't know. No. So when, um, so if you teach, like, if you're aiding children who are like four or five year old, how would you, what is the best way to go about it in a um, school setting? What, what would you say? The first thing, the first thing, I think the underlying thing is for one to develop that, that sense of presence. Yeah, because, you know, I talked about the, 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 the problem that we have with distraction. Uh, you know, we're victims of that as well. Yeah. So the, the act of, of presence of uh, what I call even the locked being in the moment. The second thing, and this sounds airy-fairy, but I, there's no other way I can say it. Um, and I'm not an airy-fairy type of person, but... Is, is to really be conscious of yourself, uh, is, is to really to love what you're doing and to love the individuals that you're working with. Uh, and also perhaps maybe to diminish, you know, your idea of, uh, as, an in, as an adult amongst another group of people who are children to kind of to dissolve those barriers. Yet at the same time, you know, I'm not suggesting that that they treat you as an equal, but um, um, yeah, those are the basic things I think that I would start with. First of all, the sense of presence, real sense of yeah. presence, really looking and really listening to individual children as much as possible. It's not easy. Um, and also to mahaba, yeah, the, yeah, the love. There's, there's, yeah. there's no other way of saying it. It sounds okay. very funny, but, no, no, it makes sense. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mariam. Um, so I'm, there's a few more questions and I realize we've actually reached the end of our time, but if Abdullah, if you're okay, we can, is it okay to continue? Then, you know. Open-ended. Yeah, open -ended. that's fine. I mean, people are, you know, if you need to leave, then please just um, do so. But um, the next person is Ali. Thank you, Farah. Hi Stephen, thank you so much for the talk. I really, really enjoyed it. My name is Aveen. I'm a research associate like Farah in the Faculty of Education. Um, 
I want to be slightly controversial. And I don't know if you will see this controversial. I think from your talk, I got the impression that maybe you're alluding to akhlaq being something a bit more sublime rather than having this dichotomous, um, either religious or secular thing that we yeah. all aspire to. And I think akhlaq is, to me at least, I see as more sublime way of behavior. And I don't, I don't like to approach it from a religious point of view. I just want to know what your opinion about that is, especially because I think, we, are we assuming that everyone who grows up as a Muslim will stay a Muslim? So for example, we know that a lot of Muslims will eventually become secular. And my voice is breaking because <laughs> I'm very scared about this question. I've asked it in many, many talks and I think I just get attacked a lot by Muslims. I am ethnically Muslim. You think I'm gonna jump up with a sword and say, <laughs> Sorry? So you think I'm gonna jump up with a sword and say, Allah, Allah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. And I think, but M Muslims have um, attacked not in that way, but um, I think they just don't like the question. But the reality is, especially as we're becoming more globalized and people move, mm. our children, as much as we'd like to raise them as Muslims and mm. we'd like them to stay Muslims, there is a strong likelihood that they will become more secular. It's a reality well, my parents had to face with me and so on. And I'm just wondering, how would you then approach akhlaq? Well, I mean, I'm not, and I'm not being, I'm not countering you out of spite or anger or anything, but I, you know, I would, I would like to suggest that there, there is the potential for that not happening. And what I, but I, but I agree with you at the same time. And I think that's because the way in which Islam has been, I mean, to be honest, okay, I became Muslim when I was a young man, when I was in my very early twenties. And, and, you know, my experience now over, over 40 probably 45 years now, has been enough for me to say that if I had been born Muslim, I probably wouldn't be speaking here tonight. So what I'm trying to say is, is that I, I don't think the potential of, of, the, of the religion is realized by Muslims. And part of this is set up in the way that uh, children are taught akhlaq. Yeah, so... I would agree with you to some extent, but I would also beg to differ that there is a, an alternative. Um, and, and, and we must uh, kind of search that out. Not out of desperation, but just because we want uh, the evolvement of people, the refinement of people. So I don't know if that answers your question. Can I just add to that? I, I actually wasn't taught akhlaq from a religious point of view. Mm -hmm. So up until the age of 12, I was in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. And we had a lesson that was called Akhlaqiyat. Okay. <laughs> and in it, it was like, I think Saddam's um, approach to that in the curriculum was that it should be, because <laughs> he decided everything in Iraq back then. I don't know if others would agree with me, but he definitely had control of the curriculum. Yeah. Um, but it, it was nice in that, and I don't like Saddam, by the way, but I think his approach to education was nice in that Akhlaqiyat was taught from a completely secular perspective. So we, it, it was when we started in primary school, it even included things like how to behave on the dinner table, for example. And then it got more and more complex. But my, my, I think my problem is when we try and say that only religion or only Islam can provide good akhlaq. I think that's when it becomes a problem. Why can't we see it as just a more objective thing that that is human? humanistic it precedes any religion right i think even if we didn't have religion we probably would have come to well, this to this point I mean, where we had akhlaq yeah i mean i, th I think one of the um, i think one of the ways that i became was was that you know i was raised my father is here this evening actually very, very proud to see him here but um i was raised uh in d different countries, I was raised sometime in Puerto Rico, which is a, you know, Latin America, and I would say that there's a there's a type of um, etiquette or courtesy uh, within sort of uh, the Latin American and even the Hispanic tradition, um, which is yeah, w which you could identify as akhlaq, but. Um, I think there comes a moment within the Muslim aspect where where I would think that we this could be because it's it's related to the prophet, all right? It's related to the prophet, as I said. So I would argue that it comes to its full potential through the, that realization. But that's not to say that 
there are people who are non-Muslim, maybe never heard of Islam or don't really know much about it, who have you know very very good, um, meaningful and authentic uh, identification with others and manners with others. Yeah, and you know I have no problem saying, oh, that person had good akhlaq. I'm not going to say, oh, he didn't have akhlaq because he's not Muslim. I think that would be ridiculous, but yeah. Okay, thank right. you. Um, so, Farah, could, could I make a comment, please? It's Yasmin. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, did, have you asked a question already? If you no, I, I'm so okay. sorry. I just joined for late. My apologies. No, no, okay, then, well, I mean, if I can just say that after you, I'm going to come to Jorg, Daniel, and then Shabnam. But yes, go ahead, Yasmin. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, thank you very much, Stephen Abdullah. I'm sorry I missed missed so much of this phenomenal presentation, I'm sure. And I just wanted to just say a very quick comment about akhlaq. I mean, for me, I think it's very much about behaving with um, authenticity and integrity and behaving in an ethical way and beha behaving in a very compassionate and fair and just and sensitive and responsible manner. And I think obviously anybody from any faith background or no faith background can, can demonstrate those principles and values in, in their behaviors. Uh, and as I think um, uh, Brother Abdullah uh, said so clearly, from an Islamic point of view, the highest example that we have is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he's the highest um, model for us to emulate. And that's why we kind of ground so much of our tarbiya, our ethics, our akhlaq, uh, you know, on, on his uh, example. I just want to finish with one final point. Um, my brother died from COVID-19 last week. He died in one day. Uh, in one day, he had a, a blood clot and he died. And uh, we've had uh, the bereavement since then. What's been phenomenal is my brother wasn't particularly practicing, but what he had was an incredible character. He had incredible courtesy, incredible servitude towards others, incredible compassion and love, mahabba that you talk to, playing with the children, respecting the elders, looking after the stranger, the wayfarer, the neighbor, Muslims, non-Muslims, whoever, men, women, children. So actually the reason why people around the world are, are pining his loss right now, is not because he was a mufti or he had a long beard or he, you know, whatever, whatever. He was just an incredibly courteous, loving, kind person. So it was his akhlaq, this husn al hulk mm -hmm. which actually was, that raised his profile, that raised his honor in the sight of people. So mm -hmm. I think very often Muslims, uh, they unfortunately value the outer trappings of, of the faith and the sincerity and the integrity and the authenticity, which is what the prophet, peace be upon him, primarily came for, actually that is lost. Um, but I just wanted to share that with you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next person is Jorg. Can, can you unmute yourself? Assalamu alaikum. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, um, yes uh, I'm joining you tonight here together with my wife Amina. She's also on the other uh, laptop. Uh, we are joining you from South Germany and we are both engaged in Islamic education at the University of Education in Karlsruhe, Baden-Württemberg, and we are responsible for the training of teachers. They teach uh, or they are supposed to teach Islamic education in state schools, so not in Islamic schools but in official state schools. This is a project that we have here and the interesting thing is that in our curricula, we have something like a, like a change of thinking. We are not teaching anymore just subjects that the pupil have to learn, but we try to think the other way around. If we can um, somehow generate options of um, behavior for the pupils. So that means to, to, to generate competence within the pupils that comes out from them through our teachings, but not like just a stuff or a moral uh, concept that we throw upon them, but we try to raise that within them. So this is just um, 
a comment and also a question of what you think about this um, specific approach. Yes, uh, thank you, Jorg. That's, that's very interesting. I, I think, um, yeah, this is, you're certainly touching upon some of the things that I've come to after many, many years in education, that, in, that it, we need to foment things coming from inside the uh, pupil rather than it coming yes. from outside, if that makes any sense. But simply because it's far more meaningful and far more effective than, uh, than the other way around. So, um, you know, all power to you. Well done. Good. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Daniel, can I come to you? I think you, you're you okay to unmute yourself, right? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, just thank you so much, Abdullah, for, for, for your fantastic talk. I've enjoyed it so much. And it's just so great to have Jorg and Yasmin and so many people here having this discussion. Um, so... I'm interested, just following on from the discussion, because uh, Marion brought up this idea of, you know, working in a Catholic school, but probably with some students from different religions. Um, we know some, some faith schools in, in England of one faith have a majority of another faith and so on and so forth. And then we've got the secular world and uh, worldviews. And in England, we've, we've long had... Uh, uh, something in law called spiritual development, which is something which supposedly transcends religious and cultural divides, but is a kind of, um, let's say, not not a not not quite a universalist approach to ethics, but the idea that there's there's a domain of education which should um, relate to this spiritual dimension of, of holistic development and of course it's been um sort of ignored quite a lot because people don't understand it and so on um and i just wonder listening to what you're saying just how relevant this concept could be for people of all faiths and of none because uh for me listening i'm quite inspired by it um although uh i myself um you know, I'm not, I, I'm not a scholar of Islam and I, I'm not a, a practitioner of Islam, but I, I'm, I'm very interested in the idea. So I guess my question is, is how adaptable could it be and how much does it have to offer to the non-Muslim world? Oh, I mean, I, I think, um, I, I, I said at the beginning, I think that, I think that the basic principles could, could, could be uh, adopted elsewhere. It, it's simply... Mm. it's simply if I just state it simply it's, it's kind of de-regulating de <clears throat> um, and de uh, what's the word de-standardizing if you like education so I mean I think that's something that that all modern education secular religious or Muslim could uh, definitely do with because you know I think it's trapping children and young people's uh, p potential. Um, so I think, it, yeah, I think, you know, it would need to be um, <clears throat> obviously adapted. I'm not sure I'd use the word akhlaq because it's a specifically um, Arabic Muslim world, though I know that uh, Avon may, may, may not agree, but um, I think it, I think it's, a, I, I think it's, it's something to consider um, the, the possibilities of. And I, and I, uh, I don't see why it should remain only within the religious realm, no. Okay, thank you. Um, Shabna, my, uh, can, would you like to ask your question? Yes, please, Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum, Jazakallah khair for the talk. It's very interesting. Um, I'm very much um, a fan of this holistic approach um, and the importance of self-awareness and being able to take advantage of situations um, within a, in a, in a setting. Um, yes. To aid that practically, you mentioned um, children, not only children, they have to reduce distraction, but adults as well. So for the children and also for myself, do you have any practical advice that you could suggest to reduce that distraction? Um, I, there, there are now so many exercises within the mindfulness uh, genre. I think, you know, some of them are very useful and good. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> 
I think it's, it's this this particular thing is quite easy to deal with in a sense. Well, relatively, um, it's not it's not as open ended and loose as what I'm speaking about in terms of developing a sense of obligation rather than morals, because you know it's simply about it's simply about getting your mind to to focus where you want want it to, you know, and to have to increase your amount of concentration. Um, and the other benefits that it has uh, psychologically, physically, and spiritually. So, yes, I think, but I, I think, yeah, there's so many exercises which can be used in schools and which can be adapted from, from the mindfulness uh, kind of uh, genre. So I, I would do that. Very, very important. Yeah. Okay. Um, could I just follow up with that before I come to, I think Deva has got a question, but um, so do you see a difference between mindfulness and dhikr? Yes. Yes, I do, yes. Right. I mean, yeah, there, are, there are shared elements, but I mean, I think the focus of, the, of dhikr and the focus of mindfulness are, one is faqr, you know, which is think, to think, and the other one is dhikr, which is to remember, okay? So I think that there are, yeah, fundamental differences, but there are as well some some connections, yeah. So, so if you could, I ask why why you're saying mindfulness exercises as opposed to dhikr for generating a physical <clears throat> presence? Well, because um, dhikr is a contentious subject in some <laughs> in some parents' minds, and some some so. Um, yeah, and um, I, you know, there's no reason why you couldn't if you were able. Um, but I think I, I think in some ways I like the, the idea is to simply, at this stage, simply to increase the the uh, amounts of concentration that, and for children to become more self-aware, uh, as well as ourselves. I mean, okay, yes, you might engage in thicker, I do as well. And that is a form of mindfulness, if you like, yes. But it might be difficult getting the children to, to, to do that. Dicker, by the way, is the, um, is the remembrance of God, uh, like as in a litany, which is repeated over and over again, and which is, uh, which is said, I'm, I'm talking phenomenologically now, not to be too confessional, which, which is said to have uh, a, a real effect on the individual um, in terms of their their spiritual capacities and uh, and thirst. Okay, so thank you. Um, can I come to Tabor now? Assalamualaikum. Thank you for, the for this very insightful seminar. Um, there were many points you raised I found fascinating. Um, so you spoke about whether there is a way to impart ikhlaq without standardizing it as crucial or obligatory, um, and whether it can be instilled as a spiritual notion than simply an obligation, and how ikhlaq can occur in the moment as opposed to um, being taught in a theoretical way. So um, my question is, um, taking this outside of the schooling system, or even as something theoretically taught, to what extent does the theoretical way of imparting ikhlaq already exist in a primary home teaching and nurturing, something ongoing, something continuous, um, before the secondary even begins? Um, yeah, I'd love to know your thoughts on this. Just just the last part, Taiba, I didn't, I didn't get, sorry. Um, yeah, so I'm um, just taking this, um, this notion of, um, instilling ikhla um, in a theoretical yeah. way. Just take yeah. this outside of the schooling system um, and something theoretical talk. To, to what extent does this theoretical way of imparting ikhla already exist um, in the natural home teaching and nurturing, something that's ongoing, something that's continuous? Aha, uh -huh. okay. Are you talking about a homeschooling situation? Uh, no, not necessarily. Okay. Just something okay. just in the nurturing mm -hmm. of, of children something that already pre-exists rather than um, theoretically taught in a schooling system. To yeah, I mean, yeah, I, okay, I get you. Okay, right. So, I mean, I, my, my own experience through observation is those parents who are very, uh, what's the word, who, who are rather prescriptive about teaching akhlaq and those parents who are, if you like, by their, 
by their very nature have um, an innate sense of how to handle other people and other situations. Um, I find that children absorb uh, absorb things, if you like, almost unconsciously. So it's just it's just the the, the better way of, of of teaching. But as soon as you start saying, okay, I'm going to be you know polite and kind with everybody. I'm going to be really calm. And when there's very upsetting situations going around. As soon as you start thinking like that, because I'm going to teach the children through this unconscious method, as soon as, as, soon as you do that, you've kind of lost it. So do you, do you see what I mean? Which is why I was a little bit reluctant to be too prescriptive on how to teach what I've called the anatomy of a sneeze. Does that, does that make sense, Tayyaba? Yes, yes, it does. Um, it's quite interesting because um, like the anatomy of the sneeze, I found that point very interesting because like while it can be, um, it can be very religious and a deeper theoretical and even scientific connection to that. Yes. Uh, yes. There's volumes about the existence of an individual and how that directly links back to the divine. Um, so the, when you come back to the, you know, the prophetic ways of teaching and akhlaq and adab and um, just basic um, teachings of the Prophet um, it just comes back to the point of um, this notion of um, naturally um, instilling ikhlaq mm -hmm. um, as opposed to something that's um, forcefully um, instilled or theoretically yes. taught. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Does, are there any further questions? I don't have any hands up or any messages about questions. So, okay. Um, I, I have a couple of <laughs> questions before we. Um, and as I said to before, if people feel that they need to leave, then please just do so. Um, but um, uh, so you talked about Sharia and Fiqh, and um, I, it was really interesting the way you brought that distinction in. And I'm just thinking about lived practice and how how rare it is for people to go and refer to Sharia. And you know the way that Sharia functions is 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 is, is not, or Sharia functioned pre the modern state was a very different yeah. um, approach, and that the fiqh, the lived experience, which was yes. much much more contextualized, was the norm. Yeah. And that so what you're effectively saying is, um, that contextualization of the morality is an inherent part of our tradition. However much of the if some you know if you go and seek out a fiki opinion on something you're still looking for a ruling as such right and yet when again when i come to practice and i think about communities that still function in that kind of way a lot of people before they even go for fiqh they just go for nasiha right they just go for advice they just will seek out somebody that they know and there's a you know so there's there's another form of learning there which isn't to do with a ruling but is to do with wanting to know other essentially how and other i mean in the sense that the way that uh, nikki Baladas defines it as the proper place of things yeah um so the hikma hikma or other uh, would be the appropriate terms the wisdom or the, the the right thing to do but i think from what i can gather what you're saying is that um now, what we need to do is translate that from an interaction where you're going out to seek that to just knowing it in the instance and the moment, and that comes through. Presence. No, 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 no. I get, I get how you understood that. I, I didn't, I didn't, act, and actually, I put Sharia in because people would mention it. But I'm, I'm with you that actually it's more a question of fit, and I think that that it's you, you know that yeah you 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 I would advise that you go to a faqih. Uh, who that you have, who you have trust in, and who you you think is you know, a wide experience. Um, my point about the fit was, <clears throat> is that um, you know we need we just need to, we need to understand. I want to be respectful and not. We need to understand that it's it, it has its limitations. It has its limitations. I, I remember one imam I knew who was at a university in Canada. 
and he used to get Muslim students coming to him. And sometimes, and he said to me, sometimes, you know, I just knew it was time for me to close the, you know, the Quran and to close the books of fiqh and to put them up on the shelf and to say, okay, what's the matter? Yeah, so it's that acknowledgement that the fiqh has been given to us and the fiqh is something which we apply to everyday situations and that the outcomes through, obviously, I think by somebody who knows, the outcomes in different situations may be different. Um, so I think in that way, the fiqh acknowledges the impermanence, the constant shifting, the chaos, the apparent chaos that we undergo. Uh, so it acknowledges that uh, and, and fits with it. Does that make sense? So I'm not proposing that we, each one of us knows individually at that moment what to do, no. <laughs> Probably, I certainly don't have that. Maybe you do. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, no, thank you. That's, that's a really interesting clarification. Um, there's a couple of questions actually from Hafiz or Rahman and then from Imran. So um, Hafiz or Rahman, would you be able, would you like to unmute yourself? Oh, yeah. Rahman Akhiran, um, on your input on this topic was uh, definitely something that was quite uh, thought provoking. Uh, one of the things that um, I find I think it's quite important to understand on a general note, um, because I think it's really important to separate both religion and its people when it comes to measuring the notion of akhlaq. So what happens is um, the deen doesn't necessarily evolve, but the people do. In every single era that we find, people change. And, um, you know, morals and manners, you know, morals and akhlaq generally, it's not a, it's not a single yardstick where, uh, by which, you know, people, people measure. Um, you know, and... Generally, I think if I find that people usually use a yardstick to measure it quite globally and on a, uh, from, a, from a universal point of view. But rather, I think um, the standards of each belief system that we have uh, are determined by its perspective on the world and its, uh, and its existence. Um, and I think that both morality and law are derived from religious, uh, re religious sources and religious teachings that are practiced throughout uh, morality and law. And secondly, I, am, I genuinely believe that the Islamic ethical system is quite unique because it's, a, it's value, uh, you know, its general value and the judgment transcend all sort of worldly gains and relativistic uh, interpretations. And I think that um, there is definitely a need to promote and practice such universal values and the principles of akhlaq based on the Quranic teachings from a, and, uh, from a point of a hadith. And we do find, you know, uh, many ulama that state that, uh, that have written many work and produced a large number of books and articles on moral ethics throughout Islamic history. But however, you know, providing more space to uh, ethics area and limiting dominance uh, on classical fiqh. Uh, and that is, I find that this is uh, one of the main features of modernistic Islamic thought. Um, and then in this context, some modern thinkers uh, such as uh, Taha Abdul Rahman, he oh, criticizes, yeah. uh, you know, usulis because yeah. they consider akhlaq to be part of or uh, under tahsiniyat, which is uh, embellishment. And Abdul Rahman Taha, he believes that uh, such an approach, it contradicts the hadith, innama, uh, innama li al that I was only sent uh, to perfect uh, good character. And, you know, this hadith is mentioned in Muatta Imam Malik. Yes. I would ask this uh, uh, to Brother Abdul, uh, Abdullah, would you agree with what Taha Abdul Rahman is saying? Or would you put it in a different kind of uh, angle. Uh, I actually know Sitaha, know him very well, known him for years, and I must say to you in this particular instance, I don't agree with him, no. Uh, going back to what you said, I, I, um, I think we, if we go to the principle of Orf, you know, which is the kind of the social customs of different people, that we will find that the Akhlaq itself as the fiqh may differ according to the circumstances around. So I don't think a global statement like that of si taha, uh, I, I find it a little um, modernistic as I'm, I'm, I'm suspecting that you do or not. Yeah, yeah, no, I do, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I can't say that I agree with him though I appreciate him very much. Okay, thank you for that. So shall we come to Imran now? Um, are you, no, you, yeah, so do you want to go ahead? 
Thank you. Um, Asalaamu Alaikum. Um, and thank you. It's been absolutely great. Um, I was fully engrossed, uh, fully attentive and present. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. Up until the question started, and then my mum called, and I was like, oh, <laughs> what's the right thing to do here? <laughs> and of course, well, your mom I, comes first. Yeah, yeah, I exactly answered the call to my mother. <laughs> um, and, 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 and then I tuned back in with the um, Helen, who, who was say, saying her quote about you know, a group who was, who was silent, and somebody breaks the silence and it breaks the potential of, of, of what that silence could have given to that group. And I, I was like, oh man, yeah, what a great, great place to enter back into this, you know? Yes. And so my question is, and it's around my, my, my understanding, that what you're offering in akhlaq is a particular type of consciousness which comes from the student themselves. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned the attentiveness, the you know, intuition and, and pouncing on those, on those moments. Yes. But also by, by uh, understanding akhlaq as a consciousness, different from it as being theoretical, you're offering an opportunity for re-engagement with the resource of both narrative and um, history and context of Islamic tradition in, the, in terms of the seerah and, and, you know, and yes. like, who is, you know, the Prophet is, is the hero to Islam as much as like Hercules and, and, and these people are to the Greek tradition, classical tradition. Uh, I, would say less, I would say less the seerah and more the shama'il. More the Shamayad, the, the the books of Shamayad, like the Shifa of Qadiyad, which okay. talks more about. Do you, do you see what you see my my point? Uh, more about his characteristics, qualitative characteristics. Right. Yeah, right, right. Yep. But also in this, um, I don't know if you know Emerson. You know, and em Emerson writes on history, and and he says that in reading history, yeah. The reader should should read themselves in the in the in the biography of the heroes that they're reading about, and you know, and all these things. Yes. And maybe that then becomes the pedagogical tool in order to to you know like really uh, help the child to develop and engage with that that text and their own identity and their own Islamic education. You see what I mean? Like, or Muslim yep. education. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to to like offer that as an as as a as, sure. a, as an opening and and also um, ask you what the potential of this might be you know no no i think that's a wonderful way the, the only thing is is that i i somehow or other if you could make that exercise that identifying and weaving yourself into the narrative of the of historical figures like the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam if if you could uh, in some way, increase the air ex experiential aspect rather than the story is very effective as well. Yeah, but rather than just sitting and listening passively, if there could be some sort of uh, what was it? There was something in RE many years ago, which was uh, where they would put learning, learning experiences learning like about uh, religion and learning from religion. You know, that was yeah, the yeah. differentiation, yeah. Um, I'm right, an yeah. RE teacher by background as well. Oh, yeah, well, so, well, so was I an RE teacher in the UK, right, yeah. Great, great. Um, so, yes, there was something, gift of the child that used to, I remember there was a thing where you would make it like a cave, and it was like the cave of Hira. Right. And you would, you know, this would be like an imagined um, trip. So the more experiential, I think the better, the better it would be. I mean, I think so there's the a place for story. I think there's a place for story as well. Yeah. yeah. So the second part of that question is that, you know, the, the faqi that you were speaking of, the, the, the people of fiqh, maybe yes. that is what they've lost. So, yeah. you know, when you said you should go to an exper experienced faqi, yeah. you know, one who has lived a life where they themselves yeah. have developed their understanding of Islam to know what akhlaq means, yeah. and then to have the canon of you know hadith and other contexts in which different rulings were given to yeah. really get to an understanding of, of of what that might mean in the context of not just the time and place but also the person bringing the issue to yeah. them for nasiha yeah. you know um, I, I would agree with you 100 percent. and as i said that to farah i was thought my you know i thought you know there, there are not many of them around but <laughs> but i must say i think that is changing I think that is changing. There are several uh, young uh, ulama, fuqaha, who are kind of developing and who, 
who have what do you call it the x factor shall we call it who have that little extra something and that knowledge as well not just of the muslim context but also what's going on around outside which is really essential but hey, th thank you i think i think we really need to draw things to a close now we've been you know way, way over time um, so I just want to um, say thank you to Abdullah and to everybody else also for such an amazing discussion and an amazing presentation. And certainly I really enjoyed it. I've got lots and lots of questions, but we'll have to leave those for another time now. So just to say thanks to everybody. And um, we have got a couple more um, uh, seminars coming up. We've got Michael Murray next week. Um, and he's uh, talking about justice and education. He has a very interesting take on the situation of um, minority communities, which I think would, it would be of benefit to many people. And we also have a series of um, further seminars that you can look up on the um, on our website, webpage. Um, Dan, just to also point out that Daniel's put a couple of links, which I think are very useful in the chat. So do have a look at that and see if you want to, um, you know, connect to, to some, some of the work that he's done, which are on, on spirit, uh, spirituality and education. But I think that's everything I want to say. So um, we actually have people just uh, wanting to join even now. But um, you know, it's been an incredibly popular session. And thank you so much, Abdullah. And um, thank you, everybody else. So we'll just call it an evening now. So goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.